Hello. Uh, you can see I'm not in my usual place. I'm in a makeshift studio at a friend's house. I uh, was doing some ministry and I was pretty sure I wouldn't be able to get back in time. So I brought the laptop and I am, uh, you should see a picture of my, my setup. It's kind of cool. Anyway, uh, we're in, we're uh, somewhere else and we're um, about to study the uh, scriptures again. And I appreciate you being here with me. And I ask you just to uh, be with me while we pray and while I invite some people into the study. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to bless us. I ask you to be with us as we study your word. I ask that you draw on those who can come and want to come and be a part of this and catch us up. And I thank you for these things. I praise you for the uh, fact that you allow us to use this technology this way and that we can uh, meet like this from long distances together. And I praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello, Bernadette. You get the award for coming from the longest distance. Uh, Bernadette is, is in New Zealand. Um, okay. So um, like I was saying, I um, I was doing ministry uh, at home, and I knew I wouldn't be home in time. So I brought the laptop. Here I am in, in my uh, attractive studio. I asked... Um, I hope I hope y'all enjoy this. We um we're halfway through. We're in Acts fifteen twenty one. I'm gonna start and get some some uh, running, get a running start on that. But we have we uh, we're in a part where we're discussing sexual morality, um and and uh, we were halfway through that when we ran out of time last time. So I'm gonna back up a little bit uh, in Acts fifteen nineteen. Um, Paul and Barnabas have gone back to, to from Antioch to uh, Jerusalem to get the thoughts of the el elders of Jerusalem and non-apostles and the apostles on the Jewish uh, belief that a person can't become a Christian uh, without uh, being circumcised first. And so Peter has spoken. Now James is speaking. And so he says, after saying all the things he says from from 15, 13 to 18, he says this, Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. And then he says, For Moses has had throughout many generations those uh, who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And we talked last time about the fact that, that the, uh, the issue was that um, the things that the Jew Jewish people, whether were Christian, Jewish Christians or not, that they mistakenly said had to be done, that, that adult Gentiles would need to be um, circumcised prior to really being saved, that um, that would be insulting to them and now what james does is something he starts to talk about something that sounds like it has nothing to do with anything but he knows that jewish christians and gentile christians are going to be meeting and they're going to be doing house church and they're going to be eating meals together and they're becoming one and so there's there are sensitivities that the gentiles have there's also sensitivities that the jewish believers have and so the thing that that james says about about um the four issues that he talks about that um, that to write to the Gentiles for them, we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. And we talked a bit about how uh, it was a Gentile practice to, to maybe eat blood, which is still a common thing in Africa and some places it's the only way they can get iron into their diet. Um, that they would um, leave the blood coagulated in, in the animals that they killed instead of draining blood out like the Jews did. And, and that that was normal for them, but they were going to be bringing their food to share with the Jewish Christians, and it was going to be offensive to them because all these generations, they hadn't done it. And now we're talking about sexual morality, and, and we decided to go down a rabbit trail to talk a bit about um, how pervasive sexual morality was in the culture, which is what's happening now and um, our advancements have brought us back to pre uh, AD 33 and, and as a society and so Paul revealed some of God's ideas 
on people, on how God, on how God made people, and on sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians 6, 13, the second half of the verse, he says this, the body is not for sexual immorality, but it's for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And he says it was never God's intention. It was never God's intention that we practice sexual sin with our bodies. And this is precisely why the devil tempts us to do such things. It's because he knows, the devil knows it violates God's designs and God's intentions for our life. Then God encourages, then Paul, God through Paul, encourages Christians as to how to deal with sinful sexual temptation. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18a, he says this, flee sexual immorality. So after this encouragement, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, gives us his reasons for us to, um, to flee sexual immorality. And in, in the second part of 1 Corinthians 6, 18, he says this. He says, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And because all sex feels good, people tend, well, not all. There are things that people do to hurt one another. But, but since, since most sexual activity feels good, people tend to think, that even sexual sin is just harmless fun. However, all sexual sin is actually harmful for the human who practices it. In my searching, sexual sin is the only sin I've found in the Bible that, that says the person who commits the sin actually sins against himself. I think that's interesting. There is one Final thing I'd like to say here about sexual immorality that I believe is part of why James spoke on the topic in Acts 15, 19 and following. There was a person in history known as Jezebel. Now that name gets thrown around anytime anybody disagrees with the spiritual leader. But it's a real being uh, who used sexual sin to control people. And Jesus mentions this person in, in Revelations 2 through John. In Revelation 2, 20 to 21, Jesus says this through the Apostle John. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allowed that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. So what he's really talking about here is that there was a demon who was an operation behind the person of Jezebel originally in the Bible, who was still actively working through people um, at the time that uh, Revelations was written. And when, when Jesus says this, he says, you know, she refers to herself as a prophetess, but really is demonic and is working through people. And and what and what that demon was doing through people was to teach and, and seduce the servants of Christ to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, why would Jesus mention Jezebel, who is physically long dead in the present tense in this passage? Because of what I just said. When she was alive, a demon worked through her, and this is why sexual sin and eating of things sacrificed to idols, physical representations, an idol is a physical representation of a demonic, demonic entity. This is why they're spoken of together by James and also by Jesus in this Revelations 2, 20 and 21 passage. That demon is still at work on the earth today. And that's why we see so much sexual sin in the world and sadly in the church today. That's why we see people confused about their genders. People confused about their sexuality, trying to normalize things like pedophilia and necrophilia and bestiality and on and on. It's because that spirit is at work and it looks like the whole culture has just turned itself over to it. Now, I've decided to speak on this in this act study because I thought it was important that when James mentions abstaining from sexual immorality in Acts 15, to some first century Christians, the scriptures have been allowed to stick around to say, for James to say that to us today. Like he said, he, he, he wrote to us 
abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. And some of these things are still happening today. I mean, heck, I've done, I've, I've been in homes with a team in the past, um, people that I trusted at the time, that um, we would be invited to help people figure out why they were having trouble stopping some behaviors. And we would go in and we would label things that we knew to be um, polluted by, by idols, by demons. And, you know, certain um, books and certain, you know, not, not being some crazy lunatic Christian, but, but really knowing that, that, um, that demonic activity had been associated with certain symbols and certain artifacts and things like that and certain practices. And so because of that, we would speak to those things. These things are still happening. And that's why um, thinking about things polluted to idols is important for us in 2020. And so these demons are still at work today. So let's commit to renouncing sexual sin in any and all of its forms. And the best way to do that is to refuse to practice it. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 13b, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Let's dive into the deep end of the pool and what Paul says here in Harvest. All the Lord intends us in this beautiful idea of practicing sexual purity. And that cannot happen if we live a sexually immoral lifestyle. Getting back to our Acts study, we have seen the elders and apostles in Jerusalem ponder the whole idea of circumcision and salvation, and James has spoken. And let's not lose track of the fact that James was not an apostle. James was a local elder in the church, which was in Jerusalem. You know, we tend to kind of idolize those first 12 apostles, and we say stuff like, you know, um, they read, you know, they were the ones that set canon, and they were. They watched over those things, but, you know, Luke wrote one of the Gospels, and he wrote the book of Acts, and he wasn't an apostle. And, and, and here we have an elder who was local in the church, which was in Jerusalem. The apostles, and that's, that's in Acts 15, 18, 21, something like that. The apostles, when, when he stood up to speak, think about this. The apostles, those original apostles, submitted to this elder, a non-apostle, when he spoke. Now, once the body of Christ was up and running, in any given place, the apostles did not hold an office in that place. Apostles then and now, because there's a lot of talk, there's books being written on this issue. Apostles then and now are for the entire church, not for some subset in a geographical area, and certainly not for one congregation separate from all the others in an area, since that idea is totally foreign to the scriptures. And so in Acts 15, 22, after Peter spoke and James spoke, um, James said this, or, or Luke reports this, then it pleased the apostles and, and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also known as Barsabbas, and Silas, who were leading men among the brethren. So notice that it wasn't just people with titles and roles, like apostles, that, who made the decisions as to who would go back to Luke. I mean, to Antioch. Luke says that the whole church made this decision. That means everybody that was born again, like, like where you are, that would mean that you, whether you had a title or any kind of diplomas or any kind of pieces of paper hanging on your wall, that you would be uh, welcome to give your opinion at this. Isn't that refreshing? Isn't it weird in the modern day body of Christ? Um, um, what we're told is that doing such things would not be done, being doing things decently and in order. And apparently it was decent and in order for him to do it in, in, a, in a, you know, AD 34 or something like that. Or oh, however, what time, what it was. I guess it was probably about AD 45 or so when this happened. Um, 
And so Luke says the entire church made this decision. And when they did, they chose people from among themselves. These men were chosen because uh, the people knew them. They were known. Have you ever noticed uh, how, how many times um, people, maybe it's you, will be involved in, in a Christian group and you know nobody really knows you? There's two reasons for that. One of, and, and they're, they're um, amplified by, by our tendency now to try to build large organizations instead of worshiping in small intimate groups like, like they did in the Bible. Um, one of the reasons is that um, they're so big that uh, it's easy to get lost in the shuffle. And, and a lot of us, and the second reason, there's a lot of us like that. We don't really want to be known. We don't want people to know our stuff. We don't want people to know what's going on with this. We don't want people to know. We think things like this. Well, it's my life and it's nobody else's business. I'll just say this. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, it ain't your life. It hasn't been your life since the day you confessed Jesus as your Lord. Our lives belong to the King. And therefore, when he assembles a group of people, we belong to one another. And so it's wrong for me to withhold myself. It actually cheats the body of Christ of, of the, uh, or, or for you, I'll say it for you. So if I say it this way about me, it'll sound prideful. It is wrong for you to withhold yourself from the body of Christ because you are a treasure. You are God's workmanship and you've been placed in the group, whether you shop the group or not, <laughs> you've been placed into a group for God's own pleasure. And you're a gift to that place. And when we withhold ourselves, whatever gifts and talents, whatever God has put in you for the good of his body, never gets harvested because uh, we don't feel like being, um, being known. We want to be separate. We want to be apart. We want to withhold ourselves. And I just believe that's a problem. These people, uh, Barsabbas or, or uh, Judas, and Silas in Acts 15, 22, they were known by the entire body of Christ in Jerusalem. Every saved person in Jerusalem knew who they were. And this is one big reason of many why the body of Christ is designed to function as an organism and not as a top-down uh, organization with the pyramid-style uh, organizational chart. In a body that functions healthily as a body, Everyone is known. This is also why so many of us prefer to be a part of organizations and not functional bodies. Far too many of us do not want to truly be known by our brothers and sisters. And the devil knows this, and he plays to that weakness in mankind. So I'm going to read through Acts 15, 22 again, and I'm going to stress something else. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with, with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas and Silas, leading men of the brethren. And this is interesting. One man was cho who was chosen was Barsabbas. Now, he was a Jewish Christian whose name means son of the Sabbath, which would be a pretty cool name to have, don't you think? Silas, a Greek or a non-Jewish Christian, was the other. Now, his name, Silas, is an Aramaic form of the name Saul. So here we have two apostles, Paul, formerly named Saul, and Barsabbas. And according to Acts 15.32, we're going to see two prophets. So we have, and that's Barsabbas and Silas going to Antioch. So here we have a team of two apostles and two prophets going there for whatever reason that the Lord wants them to be sent. To this day, and you don't see this a lot because many organizations um, don't believe in apostles and prophets today, even though God apparently does because he still makes them and he still equips them. And this is, and, and it's, uh, but to this day, even though um, that's forbidden in some places, uh, God still uses this combination of apostle and prophet working together in places at times. He still does that. 
you know, it's God knows what he's doing. He has given certain gifts, which we saw in, um, in uh, Ephesians 4. He's given people that have roles, apostles, prophets, pastors, uh, evangelists, and teachers. And they're all still necessary. And so, so it seemed best to them that they send these four men back to Antioch to, to report what the group of elders and apostles in Jerusalem decided about this whole issue of, of um, people needing to be circumcised before they could be, you know, uh, somehow get that merit badge and then they could be saved. Uh, and so in Acts 15, 23, <clears throat> they wrote this letter by them. And so they wrote a letter that they were going to send by way of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, they wrote, two, and so they say, here's who's writing. In, in the order of the day, we write a letter and we go, hi. Um, they wrote a letter and they say, here's who's sending the letter. And so that's how they start it. They, they always did that. And you can see it in all of Paul's letters. He's I, Paul, an apostle, or whatever, to whoever he's writing it to. And sometimes they'll say who sent it. That's what they do because this is the way that they did letters in those days. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren. Who is it written to? To the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. So there's their hi. Hi. You know, and so they say, here's who's sending it. Here's who it's to. Hi. Greetings. These men, Paul, Barnabas, or Sabbath, and Silas would be going to the Gentile Christians in Antioch, Syria, and in Cilicia, and giving a verbal report on the findings of those in Jerusalem who had grappled with the issue of salvation without circumcision first. These Gentiles and any Jews who disagreed were going, they knew they were going to need more than their word about it. You know, they send Paul and Barnabas off. Those people are not going to accept Paul and Barnabas coming back and saying, well, here's what they said. They agreed with us. And so some people were sent. That's why it is important that a letter was sent with them. And that's also why it was important that Silas and um, Judas were able to go back because they can say, look, we didn't come with Paul and Barnabas in the first place. We've been sent back to say, yes, that letter is real. And so he continues. So we'll go back to that part. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. And then verse 24. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Now remember that. Paul and Barnabas left Jerusalem, and then they went to Antioch, and then they went off to Cyprus, and then they went to Asia Minor. I think it's interesting here that they, they recognized that people's souls were unsettled. You know, God, our Father, cares when our souls are unsettled. We've had some things happen in our circle in the past uh, couple of years. It unsettles our souls. And I think it's okay for us to have unsettled souls. I think it's okay for us to acknowledge that. And I think it's okay for us to allow the Lord to address it. It's okay if we're not happy, happy all the time. Um, because there's some stuff happening that's not happy, happy. You know, but it's also cool to see that apostles and elders in the first century church were recognizing that someone's souls were unsettled. I think that's great. So they begin by saying, in essence, we heard that some people tried to rile you up and annoy you, so we decided how to handle that. That's basically what those two lines talk about. Now, why was this discussion taken to Jerusalem in the first place? Well, letter writers tell us, we have heard that some who went out from us, so the ones bringing doubt and discord came from Jerusalem. And they're recognizing that when they're saying the people that were aggravating you, they came from here. They decided to come from here and bug you in Antioch. Um, they, they came out from us. Um, the ones bringing doubt and discord came from Jerusalem. So the so resolution of the era 
would also come from there, would come from Jerusalem, but from the body of Christ in Jerusalem. And in verse uh, 15, 25, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Now, recently I was having a conversation with someone and, and they were trying to um, um, micromanage the words that I was saying. And one of the things that I try to practice that I learned from uh, studying the scriptures and also from being my age and having been doing this a long time is that I don't think it's good for us just to fly by the seat of our pants when we say things, especially when we're trying to represent the Lord uh, in, in teaching or in discipling or in watching over people and counseling and all those sorts of things. So one of the things I try to do is I try to make every one of my words count. I, I try to pick and choose my words specifically to communicate well. And the reason I do that is because I am aware that the body of Christ is malfunctioning because the body of Christ, which is a body with a head, Jesus, it says in Ephesians, isn't functioning well because the nervous system in the body of Christ isn't working well. It's not sending messages well. And so what happens is we get all these misfirings, we get miscommunication, we get um, receptors, people are hearing things and they're already wired to hear what they want to hear and not communicating clearly what's going on. So I, I believe, and I'm, I'm just saying this to encourage us, especially when our emotions are high or the people we're talking to have emotions that are running high. Let's do our best to communicate well, to say exactly what we want to say, if we're, if we're trying to say what we're hearing the Lord say to us, or if we're trying to uh, just interpret what the Lord has said in the scriptures, let's do it clearly. If we don't know, let's just say that. And when we communicate it, communicate in such a way that we get some feedback so we'll know that the message was, was, was done right, that, that it was communicated well. In our physical bodies, Information goes from here, goes from our receptors like our eyes and our ears and our nose, goes to the brain. And, and if those things don't send the information correctly, the head, the brain does not interpret it correctly. And then when it tells the hands and feet to do things or the organs to do things, it won't work well because it's miscommunicated. Or if the neuron, you know, all, all a nerve, um, pathways in our bodies if they don't pass the inflammation along uh, clearly then what we're going to have is what we call nervous disorders in the body in our physical bodies and the same thing is happening in the body of christ today because we're there are woundings and we don't get them healed uh, let's let's do that let's dedicate ourselves to doing a good job for our lord by doing the best we can to communicate clearly. And if we can see that we're not being heard correctly, let's try to rephrase it so whoever's receiving it can receive it well. And, and the reason I'm saying that, well, personally, like I said, I, I try to practice that. Um, accused of not practicing it well sometimes, but I'm trying. Um, um, but, but here, the words that they're choosing in this one sentence is, um, is so specific. They're so specific. He says, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Saul. So much gets communicated in that sentence. I love the term, it seemed good to us. Even though it has no special meaning other than what it means to us today in the English, built into it is unity. That's a given in the way the sentence is given. True fellowship. The word us is a beautiful word. Have you ever noticed how many times Christianity is expressed in terms of them when it's talking to someone in, in another organization or uh, that thinks a little bit differently than us? Satan is always going to try to kill, steal, and destroy. And one of his favorite things is division. And that's why I, I don't want to see the world in terms of us's and them's. 
when it's talking about the body of Christ. When it's talking about the body of Christ interacting with the world or with the lost, that is an us and them thing. But we're not us's and thems. We're all us, right? And so, so he says that. That idea is substantiated by what is said next in the letter. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord. Now, I checked into it, and that term shows up 11 times in the book of Acts. And it always has to do with being of one mind or being together. And this is how God intends the church to operate. <clears throat> and that, sadly, stands in stark contrast to the modern church, in which so many Christians see themselves as belonging to themselves or belonging to some kind of subset of the body of Christ. I belong to Bob's Church of Rama. I belong to this congregation. We belong to Jesus. We don't belong to subsets. People that are associated with what we do through Mike McInerney Ministries don't belong to Mike McInerney, don't belong to Mike McInerney Ministries, don't belong to some style of Christianity. We belong to the King. And that's how I see myself, and that's how I hope we all see ourselves. The bride of Christ today functions like a schizophrenic person and not of one mind, not of one accord like it did in the first century. And that's sad. And it's, in, it's, in, it's inhibited our, our functionality and it's, it's really hurt our mission to reconcile people with God and reconcile people with one another. May the Lord restore us soon to his original intent for us as a church, as a one body one church and so he says uh, in 15 and 20 uh, 15 25 and 26 it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men in other words they didn't do it haphazardly they picked specific individuals with our beloved Barnabas and Paul men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by referring to Barnabas and, and Paul as being beloved, they were showing extreme approval of them, something a Jewish person who might read the letter would definitely notice. You know, because basically they were disparaging Paul and Barnabas, and they were saying that when you went to Cyprus and then you went up into Pisidia and Derby and Lystra and all those places, and you led people to Christ without circumcising them first, you weren't doing anything of any importance. And here, they were minimizing Paul and Barnabas. And here, by saying our beloved, our beloved Barnabas and Saul, the people who were saying those things about Barnabas and, and Paul would notice that. The word, the word is, I'm going to spell it, A-G-A-P-E-T-O-S, agapa, agapetos. I don't know how to spell it. A-G-A, agapetos, agapetos. It was used in the Bible only, I checked it out, only to refer to Christians as being united with God or with one another in Christian love. So when we say, today I saw one of my, well, two of our friends, uh, the person that I was with today, we visited two of our friends. They're beloved friends. And they treated us as beloved friends. They're beloved, why? Because we're Christians who are united with God and we're united with one another in Christian love. I told one of them, Eddie, I said, um, I gave him a big hug, he gave me a big hug, and I said, Every time I see you, it's as if I just saw you just minutes ago, you know, and it's because the regard we have for one another still exists, even if we don't see each other for long periods of time. We are beloved. We are united with God and we're united to one another in Christ. Referring to those accompanying Barnabas and Paul, those sending the letter say, it seemed good to us to send chosen men to you. And that word chosen is a Greek word that involves preference and selection from many choices. These men were handpicked for this honor. The scripture said earlier that they were leading men in Jerusalem. Well, apparently there were many of those. And so they handpicked them among many 
choices. These men were handpicked for the honor. One reason they were chosen was that they had risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, there are a lot of people among us that do stuff in hopes of being noticed for doing it. And if you don't believe that, watch their Facebook post, and they'll be telling you all the time the great, awesome things they did for God. Um, and then there are people who do what they do, and then sometimes people notice it. I think that's what these saw, uh, Silas and Barsabbas, that's what they were like. Somebody saw that they risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we read that or we listen to that, and we might be tempted to think, well, I live in my city or my little town. Nothing's happening here that remotely gives me a chance to risk my life for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would disagree. Because of what the word risked literally means. It is the Greek word paradidomai, P-A-R-A-D-I-D-O-M-I. And it means risked means to surrender, to yield up, to entrust, to transmit, to cast, to commit, <clears throat> to deliver up, to give up, or to put into prison. It doesn't speak of times such as when Paul knew people would try to stone him to death, but he kept preaching Jesus anyway. This is not that kind of risk. This has to do with the mindset <clears throat> and a decision based on that mindset that someone like Paul made long before the day of crisis had come. It has to do with surrendering our lives to God. It has to do with committing our very lives to him. It has to do with giving over our lives to the Lord. When we risk our lives like this, when we're faced with a time of immediate risk, as we know the word, we won't run away afraid because we know we don't belong to ourselves. It's important for us to make the decision now before something comes that challenges our faith that we're in and we ain't going nowhere. It's important for us to say, we belong to the Lord and if he wants me to die, I'll die. If he wants me to get arrested for my faith or put in Facebook prison or whatever, Facebook jail, you know, that it's worth it because the Lord says so. That if you know, it's important for us to, th to, to think the day I got saved, I surrendered my right to make those decisions about myself and I truly belong to him. And so I, I want I want to um to live it. That Whatever he brings my way, I'm in. I'm going to go through it. I'm not going to go around it. I think about Christians that minister in warring countries who serve in, or who serve in leper, leper colonies. We have friends that have served in Kenya and Uganda and places that at times can be a pretty dangerous place because people don't like them. They're from somewhere else or because they're from America, so they must be rich or, or um, they don't believe in their religion or whatever. You know, I think about people living in those places. They aren't risking their lives when they go there because they surrendered, they risked, paradinamai, their lives long before they went to the place of physical danger. So that when they were called into a place that we would call risky, it is not their lives they're risking. Rather, it is Jesus's life in them since they belong to him. We miss out in the body of Christ today whenever easy is equated with grace. Do you ever notice how many times people do that? When something easy happens, well, that must be the Lord. That must be the grace of the Lord. And sometimes it is. But wherever the gospel is wrapped in self-serving language, where people who are born again never hear that they don't belong to themselves, were cheated out of the deeper Christian life. When I did prison ministry for many years, and even now, I have never rushed people to Jesus. Right now, if I met someone and we began to sit down and, and I realized they weren't born again and we begin to talk and I can see them moving towards wanting to be, I'm not going to hustle them into it. I'm not going to go on a fast track with them. Before we pray any prayers, 
when I was in prison ministry for many years, before we prayed anything, I would look him in the eyes and say, do you understand that you are asking Jesus to purchase you and that after today, you will never ever again belong to yourself? Do you understand that after you receive Jesus as your Lord, you will never ever have the right to make decisions about yourself without first consulting your owner, Jesus, and getting his approval or his go ahead? I'd ask him that. And some of them would go, I don't want to do that. And I'd go, okay, well, thanks for listening. I love you. I hope you change your mind one day. I wasn't trying to, you know, how Snoopy would, you know, stamp the Red Baron on the side of his plane every time he shot him down. I wasn't interested in collecting a bunch of medals that way. I was interested in leading someone to Christ in such a way that they would be able to live the deep Christian life because they knew they didn't belong to themselves. I wanted them to live authentic Christianity. I don't want to go to Jesus and say, I led people to Christ to you in a shallow way. And this is an almost forgotten truth. When we receive Jesus as our Lord, he purchases us. Now, if you've been watching, this is the 52nd of, of I don't know how many of these, maybe 100 uh, sessions that we're doing. And I've talked about this several times because I, I know that it's not talked about much. And so I talk about it all the time. First Corinthians 6.20, Paul says this, or the, or the Spirit says this to Paul, because you were bought at a price. You were bought, purchased at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which belong to God. First Corinthians 6.20. And then again, and what we call a chapter later, which is really a letter, no chapters and letters. But in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 7, 23a, he says, you were bought at a price. Now, now, you know, the Bible principle is that if God says it once, it's impossible. If he says it two, I mean, it's very, it's very important. If he says it twice, he's saying this is really important. When a person was born again, he saw fit twice in one letter to the Corinthians. To make sure they understood that when they received the Lord, Jesus purchased them and they no longer belong to themselves. It's important for us to dwell on this. And I hope, I hope we all do tonight. Jesus' blood is the price that he paid for us and that he still pays for Christians. And after that, we never belong to ourselves ever again. And it would be good for us to scrutinize our hearts and invite the Holy Spirit to search us to see if we believe that we belong to ourselves or if we belong to the Lord. We'll know it if we aren't living it. And God can fix that in us if we're willing to repent. So back to Acts 15, 25 through 27. In a letter that James and the elders and all the church and, and uh, the apostles and all the church in Jerusalem sent back to Antioch with, um, with these guys, it says this. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. They also sent Judas and Silas, so that the people who received the letter would know that it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas doing this. They didn't sit by the side of the road somewhere and make this letter up. They, these men were there to show the council that the council in Jerusalem really did write this letter and that they were willing to say so. The law of Moses is given partly to reveal that from the fall of man on the whole world, that it, began, uh, it became subject to law. That force in the law with a small L. That force in the world that tells us that if you do this, then you will become that. The law is all about physical performance and physical appearance and someone else being able to perceive those. The Judaizers who went to Antioch were insisting new male converts do an observable physical thing, circumcision. And then they would be spiritually acceptable for God, to God for their salvation. You ladies that are here, 
y'all aren't going to have a circumcision the way the men are. What's that mean about you? That means that you're toast. You can't be circumcised, according to these Jewish leaders back then, and uh, in, in the time of Barnabas and Saul, Paul, and and um, and then it does mean you don't get a chance to be a Christian at all because you, one has to be circumcised first. You know, it's ridiculous. It doesn't address you. It doesn't give you respect as, as an equal in Christ. They went there. They were insisting that new male converts do an observable physical thing, circumcision, and I guess. The heck with the ladies, right? And then they would be spiritually acceptable to God for their salvation. That's what they were teaching. To combat this false doctrine, the leaders in Jerusalem gave them a message that is opposite the law. And the letter and Judas and Silas were there to show that their decision was unanimous. They all agreed to this. Acts 15, 28. He says it again. But listen to what he says. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Not to, it doesn't say it seemed good to us. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And then he's going to go into those necessary things beyond uh, verse 28. These Christian leaders did not want to burden them with unnecessary things like the Pharisees did to the people they were supposed to be serving. Matthew, in, in, in Matthew 23, verse 4, Jesus uh, speaks to the people there in the presence of the, um, the scribes and Pharisees, and he says this. He says, For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with even one of their fingers. In other words, they won't even lift a finger to help. That infuriated Jesus when he saw it. In his church, he would not condone leaders who legalistically force people to do things, and then they themselves do nothing to help them do these things. He doesn't approve of such things. Have you ever noticed how many times we're told to accomplish something in ourselves, but the people who are preaching this to us or teaching this to us don't even bother telling us how to go about doing it? So he's saying, Here's a heavy burden. I'm laying it on your shoulders, and I'm not going to do anything to help you. Go figure it out yourself, if you're even awake, if you're even listening. You know, he, he's not going to condone leaders who do that. Jesus still doesn't approve of such things. However, far too many church leaders present themselves as little tyrants. Um, I was talking to someone about a cult um, that, that uh, is in Houston. It still exists. I looked it up last night, and it's still here uh, in this town. And and um, at one time, we were equipped in the church where I was uh, running a counseling center later. We were equipped for people who had been spiritually abused. And we helped. A third of that congregation migrated to ours and to some other congregations locally. And we, uh, we helped them get past that. We helped them get healed from the abuse of Jesus' spiritual leaders being like Pharisees to them. People still do this. They act like little tyrants. One day, those leaders will stand before Jesus and answer for that. And it won't be pretty. Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. In verse 25, the letter writers said it seemed good to us, referring to the people who met in Jerusalem. Here the letter says something a little more profound. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Why would they write that? They wanted to convey the truth that it was, was God who directed them to do this, to write this letter and to send them back to Antioch with this message and to make these decisions. It wasn't just humans deciding to do it. They basically said, let me make sure. <laughs> they, they basically said that it, it was the heart of God, the Holy Spirit, that they lay on them no greater burden than these necessary things. Now, saying it that way communicates effectively that not only are other things unnecessary, but they, but they were also things that burden and weighed people down. 
I'll, I'll just say this to other leaders, and if you're a parent or a teacher or, you know, um, lead anything, you're a leader. Um, when we come up with a great idea, it would be good to run it past the Lord. It would also be good for us to think, am I putting extra pressure on people and they're not helping them to do whatever it is I'm pressuring them to do? Now, having said that, I'll tell you that because of heavy-handed leadership in the body of Christ, if you are a graceful spiritual leader to somebody, they're already wired by the effects of the fall and how it's affected even the body of Christ. They're already wired for you to be a bully. They're already wired for you to boss them around. Sometimes people will demand that you tell them exactly what to do. And I'm not doing that unless the Lord says so. You know, and, and they'll, they'll get angry. Why aren't you telling me how to live? Uh, because you have what I have inside me. You have the Holy Spirit too. Let's, let's reason through these things together, but I'm not going to talk down to anyone as a leader and tell them how to live. I'm just going to communicate what the Spirit says and then um, be available for input. <laughs> you know, and it, it irritates people because they're not used to grace. They're used to, they're used to legalism. And so um, there were other things that were burdening people and weighing people down. Let's be sure that we don't do that. Acts 15, 28 to 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep you, yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell, and that's their goodbye. Sincerely, they wrote their letter, right? We discussed earlier that since Jews and Gentiles would be eating together in their love feast, and that comes from Jude one twelve, Christian home worship gatherings, this simple encouragement would help the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians to do so without co-offending one another. You know, we do, we do gatherings in our home. We do, we do church out of our home. And often, about every five or six times, I will write something in there about um, basically reminding us to pay attention to the effect that we have on one another. We're all brothers and sisters, you know, and if we accidentally say something that hurts someone's feelings, it brings discord into the body of Christ. And so let's be careful about how we say things and how, how we do things. Let's not interrupt people. Let's not talk over people. Let's not poo-poo somebody's uh, revelation from the Lord, you know, because um, we're having these love feasts. We're, we're hanging out together. So it's he says, if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. I like that term a lot. And you know, every time you, you read the Bible, sometimes a scripture will jump out at you go, I really like the way the Holy Spirit said that, you know, through Luke in this case. I like that term. If you keep if you keep yourself from these, you will do well. It basically could be restated like this. If you keep yourselves, if you pay close attention and obey by abstaining from these, you will do, you will practice, you will have a habitual life, spiritual life of doing well. In other words, being vigilant about how we live will benefit us. In other words, let's say that again. Being vigilant about how we live will benefit us. If we abstain from the things that God hates, then we will do well. So after writing that, they say farewell. And when we, I said it just now, um, when we do that, we think it merely means thanks. I'm sorry, goodbye. And this term is better translated into King James when it says fare thee well. Now, this isn't like a sincerely at the end of a letter, like I said, because I knew this was This is a blessing when somebody says farewell, or often I'll end a conversation with someone. I went to a store today and I bought something. And uh, at the end, I said, thank you. They said, thank you. I said, you're welcome. God bless you. I'm not just saying a tagline. I really hope God blesses that person. And sometimes they'll go, thanks. You know, sometimes they'll scowl at you. God, you know, who's he? I hope they get to find out, you know. Fare thee well. It's a blessing. It literally means be strengthened and healthy. 
So they write this letter. It says some things that some of the people don't want to hear. <laughs> and then at the end, they wish him well. They said, uh, you know, may you be strengthened and healthy. Hey, Dallas. <clears throat> Um, and so in verse 30, Acts 15, 30. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When it was time, when it was time, the company was sent off to these new Christians in Antioch with this letter. Luke says in the New King James that the multitude was gathered. Some versions use the word congregation. When it means congregation, it doesn't mean a subset. It was the church when all the Christians who were in Antioch had gathered, and there was a lot of them. So let's see God's grace, and this is kind of how we're going to end for today. Um, let's see God's grace and the effect that it has on people, because the letter was an act of grace. And sending Silas and Barsabbas, or Judas, um, there, that was an act of grace from God through the elders and apostles and the body of Christ in Jerusalem. So let's see what his grace, uh, how it affects the people in Antioch. Acts 15, 31. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Isn't that delicious? No fighting, no debates, no splits, which hadn't even been invented by divisive and contentious people yet. The church in Jerusalem didn't divide over the proclamation from Jerusalem, even if it was something that some people didn't want to hear. They handled it with wisdom and they handled it with unity. And even better, they rejoiced. And they saw it as encouragement. That word, encouragement, is the word, Greek word parakalesis. P-A-R-A-K-L-E-S-I-S, -E parakalesis, which is a form of the word used by Jesus to describe the Holy Spirit as the comforter or helper in John 15, 26. When I read that, I can almost sense the Holy Spirit sidling up to them bringing his encouragement. And it's a hint that those in Jerusalem who wrote the letter did so by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to stop right here for now. Um, I'm going to make a note on my piece of paper because my sticky note is buried in the notes that I started with here in my little makeshift uh, office. Later on, I might, I might post a picture on this thread of my high-tech studio that I'm operating in, in a bedroom, uh, um, visiting a friend. So um, we're going to end here for now. I, um, I'm going to close with the prayer. I want to remind you, let me get my keyboard, my high-tech keyboard, and put it on my knees here. <laughs> um, I want to remind you that uh, this will be, on this website um, sometimes later tonight when I um, get a chance to download it from Facebook and then upload it to my YouTube channel. Oh, no, to my YouTube channel. I almost made a mistake there. Um, and so it's here. You'll be able to go there. You can click on that. And right now, last week's study is there. If you... Um, if you go to this link, if you go to that link, there are um, uh, over 250 articles there that we write, that I've written, and other people, I've copied some other people's, and I, I note that it's them that are there, that you can check that out. I appreciate you being a part of this. Um, the glare through this whole thing has been driving me crazy. I hope it hasn't been distracting to you. Um, but this is where I am, and, and this is the best situation right now. Um, so let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who take the time out of their life to be a part of our study. Um, no matter when they come in, there's something there for them. 
I ask you to bless us all. I ask you to bless my friends in your new business. I ask you to bless those who are part of us and connected to us in any way who are struggling with anything emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, um, workplace related things, anything like that. I ask you to, to um, bring order to the areas that are in chaos or in disorder. I ask you to bless us with the sense of your presence. I ask you to lead us tonight into thinking about whether or not we really belong to ourselves as Christians or do we belong to you. I ask you to bless us in these ways. And I thank you for the record. I thank you that you provoke Luke to write a letter to his friend and that we get to read the letter and learn from that. I ask you to be with us, Father, all of us. Bring us back together again next week. And uh, we thank you for allowing us to do this through uh, Facebook and through um, just this amazing thing we call the Internet. I praise you for these things, and I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And uh, for those who've been praying um, for the visits I'm making right now, I thank you for that. Um, it's been a good visit so far. So anyway, I'll see y'all next time. God bless y'all. Thank you for coming. I love y'all. Bye.